please open to First First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter fourteen. First Corinthians fourteen. Or twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. But we'll start in fourteen. read verse 1 of chapter 14, shall we? Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Uh, we look down at verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. And uh, let's go down to uh, verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto, uh, unto me. And then, uh, you know what, that wasn't the... That wasn't the scripture that I intended to read there. Let's go ahead and we'll pray and we'll begin our message. Father, tonight it's important for us to just be open to the truth and the preaching of the Word of God and God to you speaking to us. Lord, I desire that we would have freshness in the message tonight that the message would edify. And I pray that it would do so by the help of the work of your Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you, as a believer, needed a good how-to, it would be a how-to speak in tongues or how to please God with the matter of tongues. If you're here this evening and you say, Pastor, uh, the, are you charismatic in the sense of are you assemblies of God or are you... Uh, four square or something like that. Uh, I wouldn't make a very good charismatic, to be quite frank with you. I just don't, don't have the right personality for him. Brother Tosh would be a good charismatic, uh, maybe. Uh, no, he actually wouldn't. It'd be Charlie. Charlie would be the guy that would. Well, maybe he wouldn't either. The truth of the matter is, is that <laughs> uh, does everybody here know what I'm talking about when I talk about charismatic? It means the word charisma is what it means, which really just means personality. Uh, or he means uh, grace. Charis is the word we get grace from. So a person who shows forth uh, grace and so forth. And, uh, the, the word charismatic is actually a term that I would find to be complimentary. So if you want to ask me in the sense of the meaning of the word, am I charismatic? The answer would be yes. But if you mean, uh, do I believe in being overcome by the Holy Spirit or by a spirit, and speaking in an unknown language uh, in the church service as part of worship, the answer would be, uh, no, we don't do that. I don't do that. I don't believe that that is appropriate to do. And I want to just look at what the Scripture says about it tonight because I think it's a real help for us as believers to just know God's opinion. The truth of the matter, though, is that oftentimes we approach things from the perspective of where we're coming from. In other words... Uh, I, growing up, a lot of my friends, a lot of my uh, even family members were part of charismatic groups or charismatic churches. That is, uh, they emphasized a lot. Uh, the I call it the fullness of power, but it isn't what they meant by it. They emphasized a lot uh, supernatural knowledge and uh, speaking in unknown languages or tongues. And so... That would be for a lot of my friends. You can't you can't categorize everybody. You can't put everybody in the same category. But for many of them, uh, it was an evidence of their salvation if you spoke in tongues. I remember uh, getting together on a Sunday night with a bunch of my friends who went to a charismatic church, and they were talking about what a great service they had. And they were talking about a five-year-old girl 
uh, that they she would gotten saved that night. So, oh, she did. They said, yeah, she spoke in tongues, so we know she's born again. And that was what they believed in their church. And, uh, you know, that's not the gospel. That isn't the gospel. Uh, the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. So some old folks would call the charismatic gifts, they call it the full gospel, as, as if the cross, <laughs> the implication is that the cross, if, if speaking in tongues is the full gospel, then the cross is partial, partial or incomplete gospel, right? And I, I don't think they'd agree with that statement. So I don't think it's fair to say that, but that's what's implied by calling it the full gospel. I also will say a couple things as well. I'm just throwing some stuff out there just, just to pique your interest, get your attention a little bit, and we're going to go to the Scripture. Uh, though most of those individuals would say that you need to speak in tongues in order to be saved, none of my charismatic preacher friends would say that I'm not saved, which I find to be partly inconsistent. See what I'm saying? In other words, if that's necessary for salvation, then you should just go ahead and say that I'm not saved. This is similar, though, to individuals who would be very close to where I'm at doctrinally, and especially on the, on the matter of uh, supernatural gifts, such as speaking in tongues. By the way, I believe in the supernatural. I believe in a supernatural God who's able to do anything He wants to. If God wants me to speak in tongues, I'll do it. I'm not limiting God in what I'm saying here this evening. That isn't where we're going with it. Uh, if God had a reason for me to speak in tongues, I'd happily do so. Now, I do not mean babble. I mean speak in tongues. I mean a language. Like what happened on the day of Pentecost, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, most of my friends that are messed up about repentance and the definitions for repentance or just putting repentance in its biblical context, like the difference between repentance for an unbeliever and the repentance for a believer. Most of my friends that would be messed up with that would really, really disagree with me even about the way to pray to be saved. In other words, they would say, in order to be born again, you need to first repent of your sins and then receive Jesus as your Savior. As though being sorry for sin does anything before you're saved. You understand, you understand the distinction that I'm making about that? In other words, I'm sorry. God, I know I'm... I, look, when I, when I uh, pray to be saved, I acknowledge my sin. God, I'm a sinner. So I need to be saved. Jesus died for my sin. I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. But what I repented about was not sin. What I pray, repented about was unbelief. That is, before I trusted Jesus as my Savior, I had not believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ obviously involved repenting of anything but Jesus, didn't it? It wasn't just uh, sin, although you could say anything that isn't belief is sin. You say, well, you're, you're uh, splitting hairs. No, I'm actually not. I'm just trying to share the gospel. The Bible doesn't say repent of your sins and be saved. It says believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And my belief is repentance. Repentance in the context of salvation is unbelief. I have friends who love the Lord and are good people and would pretty much uh, be pretty solid doctrinally who would like to argue with me about that and split hairs. And honestly, I'm, I'm pretty far beyond that. I, I kind of take the Hebrews 6 approach on that. I've, I settled a long time ago what I believe about repentance. And so it's time to move on. It's time, it's, uh, time to deal with weightier matters of the Bible and of the Scripture. None of my friends who would say that my the gospel that I preach is wrong would say that I'm not saved. I've asked them, do you think I'm lost? Don't believe what you believe, am I lost? And they'd say, well, I think you're saved. Well, how could I be saved if I'm wrong about repentance and what you say about repentance is necessary for salvation, that is the lordship uh, gospel that they preach? Pretty good question, isn't it? And the full gospel would be similar to that. In other words, if what you're saying is true, is God fair? Is He equitable? Is He equal and just? Or does God require something different from different individuals for salvation? Most of what is preached wrong, by the way, this is a caveat in case, I don't want to 
preach a message about repentance this evening. But most of what's wrong about what people preach is the confusion between discipleship and the gospel. What's required for disciples. And by the way, lordship for disciples is, is a Bible teaching. But lordship for salvation is not. So anyway, if, if that just went over your head, just let it fly on by and maybe you'll catch it another day. Okay, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14 is where our text is this evening. We're actually in a context of spiritual gifts. We go back to chapter 12 and look at verse 1. Paul begins the context for spiritual gifts here in verse 12. Matter of fact, if you really want to do a study, and it's not a complicated study, if you'd like to spend an afternoon getting settled on the matter of spiritual <laughs> gifts, you could reference for yourself Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and honestly do a pretty thorough study of a lot of what the Bible has to say about spiritual gifts. So in verse 1, Paul said to the church at Corinth, uh, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you are Gentiles carried away uh, under these dumb idols. Even as you were led, I love the use of the word dumb there. Uh, kids, take note. Paul said dumb, which means you can't speak, which means uh, they, they're not alive. And so it's perfectly appropriate for you to use a word which is used in the Bible. So you could just quote 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1 to each other's. I would not have you carried away. You know, you, you were Gentiles, you know, carried away into these dumb idols. And yeah, don't call each other dumb idols, but just use the word. Have fun with it. Okay. <laughs> in verse 3, Paul said, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Notice the capital S for Spirit of God there, and then capital H and G for Holy Ghost. This is not Spirit of Man, small s. This is Spirit of God, capital S. It's a deity, a phrase referencing deity in our context this evening. And I will say this to you tonight, my friend, that the emphasis of spiritual gifts is the Spirit of God. God the Holy Spirit. And you and I ought to understand that it's not a light matter. It isn't one that we begin with a conclusion, this is what I believe, when we deal with the matter of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not natural gifts. Isn't it incredible a lot of times how we think regarding natural gifts? When someone gets saved, a lot of times we think about immediately how that person could serve the Lord. And we usually think along the terms of aptitude, don't we? We're talking about spiritual gifts. We're talking about something supernatural that is unnatural. Not something a person naturally could do. And so a lot of times we think, man, the guy is, you know, he's really, really musical. And so his spiritual gift is going to be something that has to do with ministering in music or leading in worship. Well, it may be that God made him with ability so that he could gift him beyond that ability. But friend, being musical doesn't mean that you're called to worship. That's a natural ability that God has given you. It's not a supernatural ability. It's interesting that we tend to evaluate spiritual gifts like we do aptitude. If you're going to apply to work for American Airlines or Delta Airlines, for instance, they'd give you an aptitude test. Uh, if you're going to apply to go into the Army, they'd give you the ASVAT, and they'd find out what your, what your uh, talents or lack of talents are for, so that they could figure out what you're good at, and then they'd try to place you on the basis of your gift or your aptitude. That isn't spiritual gift. Spiritual gift is supernatural. It's the Spirit of God coming on us and giving us ability we do not naturally have. And you and I can agree that on the basis of what happened at Pentecost when the supernatural power of God the Holy Spirit came on the believers, the church that was meeting there on the Lord's Day in Jerusalem, that when that happened, that what happened happened in a way that was impossible. In other words, the commentary of those who were marveling at what was happening was that these are unlearned and ignorant men, and yet there was a list of languages 
that they could understand these men preaching in. Parthians, Medes, Persians, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, and so forth. Individuals from all around the world could hear the gospel in their own language by guys that were called, in a kind of insulting fashion, unlearned and ignorant men. That is, these guys have a language, and it's Galilean. <laughs> you remember Peter, when he was denying Jesus? And he said, I don't know him. They, she said, you're Galilean. Thy speech bereath thee. Uh, just to add a little insult to those that would feel it this evening, it's sort of like somebody being from Alabama and trying to act educated. Uh, you understand? <laughs> I don't know anybody from Alabama here tonight, so we're hopefully okay. Right, Luke? Anyway, <laughs> the point is, it's like, you know, I'm educated. I'm educated, y'all. You know, uh, no, you can't be from Alabama and convince anybody. You know, okay. Anyway, you guys understand what I'm saying. In other words, you can tell from hearing Peter and John. Now, I don't know if they spoke with their Galilean accent <laughs> in the supernatural language. That's reading into it a little much, wouldn't you say? And yet, the people who heard them preach the gospel knew they're doing something they cannot do. That is, they're speaking languages they don't know, and so the only way we can explain it is God did it. Okay? They were known languages, and they were spoken in such a manner, such a... Angela, are you ever going to forgive me? My wife told me to say that. She wasn't here. Melissa said, make sure to insult Angela tonight. So... Uh, yes, yeah, please insult Angela. I'm not there. I can't do it. So, you know, take care of it. Check with her when she gets back. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I insulted Prince Larry or Harry or whatever his name is. <laughs> the best meme was the whole, you know, I stopped caring about... Uh, British royalty in 1776 or something like that. Uh, and uh, that was Taj's line this morning. I had so many people comment, text, call me today wanting to know if my Facebook post was really by me. And it was because the whole thing was just sarcastic. I said something to the effect of uh, what's the guy's, what's the name of the guy who Larry married his wife? Or Harry? Anymore. What? Anymore. Yeah, but, but her husband. Who was, uh, who was her husband? Her first husband. Yeah. Who was he? Anyway, I said, you know, the little prince fellow is marrying so-and-so's wife, and basically I could care less. Or so, I didn't say it that way. But I said, I, you know, it reminded me of something that Thomas Jefferson said about his predecessor, and then I put the 27 uh, grievances that the colonists had against King George which implies that, you know, we don't really like the royalty in England, and so why is everybody so enamored with this guy who's marrying a 39-year-old woman that used to be another man's wife? It's just really not news, folks. So, now it's news. I just made, I just made Larry popular. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Anyway, I'm just messing a little bit. Folks, that has nothing to do with anything tonight. Just thought I'd check and see if anybody cared about... about uh, I better stop saying stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, boy, that got us a long way from where we need to be. Let's go back to where we ought to be. We're talking about Pentecost, and we were talking about individuals speaking in their own language. Now, that would be the precedent for um, spiritual power. I would just say this: this is not a, this is a study you could do on your own time, but if you will study what it means to have the fullness of power. And the phrase fullness of power, baptism of the Holy Ghost, are phrases and words that the Scripture uses, and I would use them the same as a charismatic individual would use, or a person who would call himself uh, charismatic. Uh, I would use the same phrases, but I wouldn't mean the same things by them. In other words, I, I never uh, have seen an instance in the Scripture where a person falls on the ground and barks like a dog. I'm not being silly tonight, I'm serious. I've never seen an instance in the Scripture where a person falls on the ground, barks like a dog, and is out of control. I've never seen an instance where a person goes into tremors and shakes and that sort of nonsense. That's not in the Scripture. You say, well, Pastor, what about Saul? Well, Saul was... Saul. What Saul did uh, was to prevent him from actually doing what he wanted to do. And that would be a, quite of a bit of a different occasion. But the notion that a person by the Spirit of God, 
I remember watching a video in a church, this would be in Brownsville in Pensacola, uh, where literally a man has a leash on him and he's barking like a dog and they're leading him around in the front of the auditorium and somebody's chanting, where he leads me, I will follow, where he leads me, I will follow, where he leads me, I will follow. And it's nonsense, God didn't do that. Matter of fact, uh, I don't pretend to know the heart of any individual, but I do know what people do. And I will tell you that what people do in the name of God the Holy Spirit is first blasphemy, and second of all, not what not God. God isn't doing it. The carrying on, the nonsense that happens, my friend, is either simply man blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God and pretending for the admiration of other men. That's what it is. Or it's a devil. So pick, you know, which one it is. Uh, I have in private conversations with individuals who speak in tongues, I've asked them, have you ever faked it? You ever faked it? Matter of fact, I had a friend, I said, speak in tongues, I recorded him. And we listened to him over and over again, and he said the same thing over and over again, had the same vowel inflection. It's funny that the tongue has a, a certain, you know, certain uh, repetitiveness to it, and it's just babbling. That's what it is, let's call it that, babbling incoherent babbling. It's not a tongue, not a language. And I've had those same individuals say, well, sometimes I have faked it. Well, what's the motive behind that? What's the motive behind that? To impress God? Is that what the motive is? Listen, I'm not a judge of a man, but I know what that motive is because I know myself. If I were to fake speaking in tongues, I'd do it to impress a man, not God. And that's what it's for. And so God doesn't do it, and the Bible actually talks about things that are done in the name of the Holy Ghost, or uh, credited to or against the Holy Ghost. The Bible calls it blasphemy and says that that's an, a sin that God doesn't forgive. And so it's a frightening thing to me to tamper with or to play with. And so it's a serious matter. Alright, so then what does the Bible say about speaking in tongues, or how to speak in tongues? Well, let's go back to chapter, let's go, I guess move forward. Uh, to chapter 13. If we were to summarize chapter 12, and you'll have to do so for yourself, one of the things that you will see is that there are different spiritual gifts given to different individuals, and uh, there, are, there are members in the church that are gifted, like the apostles and prophets and teachers and so forth, gifts of healings, helps, governments, and mercies of tongues. Chapter 13 deals with the motive behind spiritual gifts. You know, everybody loves the charity chapter, don't they? Uh, I went to Gu's wedding. It was in Chinese, as most of y'all know Gu. And we went to his wedding, and, she, and a, a lady, a friend of theirs, sang 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in Chinese. It was absolutely beautiful, stunning. And she was singing about love. Well, that's wonderful. I think it's good. But actually, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 isn't talking about marriage or love at all. I mean, it just isn't in context. And that's not saying you can't look at it and understand it. But what it's talking about is individuals desiring gifts for their personal edification instead of desiring to simply love. In other words, that's the best thing. And, but the conclusion in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, after talking about charity and the fact that it is better to desire and it is uh, it is the thing that validates anything else is in verse 8 charity never faileth but whether there be prophecies they shall fail whoa stop there stop there whether there be prophecies the Bible says they shall fail now whether you like the rendering for the word there uh, for fail or not, it's a solid application. Let me ask you a question. What does the Scripture say about the prophet? If we're talking about, of course, the Old Testament prophet, what does the Scripture say about a prophet failing? What are the qualifications? How do you know it's a true prophet? What? His prophecies come true. And what? He said he's, two things. He has to say, God says, thus saith the Lord. And two, his prophecy has to come true. And if his prophecy doesn't come true, two things you can do. 
Yeah. Kill him. Put him to death. He's supposed to be put to death for being a false prophet. Two, uh, you can disregard his prophecy. Because it isn't from the Lord. <laughs> okay. Is the prophecies given in the New Testament, is the prophet in the New Testament, or prophecies given in the New Testament, is that the Old Testament prophet? First 13... 1 Corinthians 13, 8, whether there be prophecies, um, they shall fail. They shall... Whether there be... What is... I, I said that wrong, didn't I? Uh, no. Yeah, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Is that Old Testament prophet? Is it? Yes or no? I don't think so. Probably not, right? Let's go to first, uh, verse 4 or... Uh, yeah, verse 4 of chapter 14. The Bible says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now, first of all, let's deal with a couple of things. I want to stay on track here and just define the New Testament prophet for you. There are individuals that would say, well, you know, the Old Testament prophet, New Testament prophet, one and the same. Matter of fact, I have had many individuals prophesy to me, quote, prophesy to me. I believe in God giving knowledge. Don't you? In other words, could God tell... Look, let me ask you a question. How many moms do we have in here? How many of you moms have found out something? Like found out something about your kids? Like you knew, you just you found you just you don't know why you didn't know, have a reason to suspect whatever, but you just found out. Maybe you asked a question, or you just had a thought. You know, why am I thinking this? I don't know, but and you found out something, and it turned out to be pretty spot on. No moms in here have ever done that, or do all moms do that? You know, pastors do that. I'm just telling you, the Holy Spirit of God has just told me things. I'm not getting spooky or silly here. I'm just telling you, the Spirit of God's just told me things. And I've even acknowledged things in an unsuspecting manner. Like I've said something to somebody and didn't mean a lot by it. I just felt led to say it. And turned out, boy, <laughs> I mean, you put your finger on something. It's like, well, I had, you know, people, I've had many times people say, how did you know that? It's funny... He wouldn't like to talk about this. I wouldn't want to embarrass him about it either. So maybe I won't talk about him by name. But I had a teenager who, at the age of 14 or 15, when I was in, uh, in my first ministry, I was an assistant pastor, I had a teenager that wasn't doing well spiritually. And uh, I never felt as though I had much influence on him. He was pretty far into the world when I first met him. But God was dealing with him. And God used me a lot. I mean, I would just be somewhere I'd never been before, in a neighborhood, at a house, in a place, and he'd pull up, and he wasn't doing things that he ought to have been doing. And I'd say, hey, to whatever his name is, and he'd say, how'd you find me here? <laughs> Who told you I was here? I'd just say, I know what's going on with you. I know what you're doing. And I had no idea what was going on. I just say, I know. I know what's going on with you. And boy, he would just be... Oh, man. Everywhere I go, Pastor keeps... I mean, I'm serious. Everywhere he went, Pastor popped up. It was like, you're here. And I, hey, what you doing here? What are you doing here? How'd you know I was here? How'd you find me? You know, what was... I mean, does, I believe that God, God's Spirit led me to know or to be in places doing things that just wouldn't normally... Be, and it was for his benefit. Do you believe that? Can God do that? Is, is God a wooden, uninvolved God who will speak to you through the Scriptures, but His Spirit will never speak to you in person? Is that the way God works? No, God speaks to us, doesn't He? Okay, so don't misunderstand me and the direction where we're going here, but when we see the New Testament prophet, it isn't the same as the Old Testament prophet. In other words, it isn't, it's not going to rain for three years. Well, I just said, it's not going to rain for three years, and how, how many years till it rained? 
And then he prayed and said, God, make it rain. And God made it rain. He also called down fire from heaven. You ever think that maybe Elijah knew he was you know, a legit prophet before he ever made that whole Baal challenge? Hey, I tell you, you call down fire from heaven, then I'll call down fire from heaven. Let's see who's right here. <laughs> I mean, to guys that are fraud, they were like, well, you know what? We may be exposed as frauds, but so will he. Well, he wasn't. He called down fire from heaven. God dropped fire. Burned up the altar. Burned up the sacrifice. Burned up the people. By it, just burned everything up. Elijah was a prophet. Is that the New Testament prophet? To do supernatural things? Is that the purpose? No, the Bible says in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 14 that the purpose of the New Testament prophet is the word edification. By the way, the word edification is used in these three chapters over and over and over again. So verse 4, the Bible says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So what's the purpose of prophecy then? To edify the church. You know what the word edify means, right? Mm -hmm. It's the word oikotomain, or it comes from the word oikos, which means house, or I built the house is what the word edify means. So a person who edifies the church is somebody that builds up the church. That is... You help it to grow or to strengthen it. There are a lot of ways to edify in Ephesians 4. Uh, speaking about spiritual gifts as well gives a lot of those ways. Verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Now a lot of people don't understand what that means. The idea, I would that you, and then rather, but rather that ye prophesied. The idea of rather is, is that it's fine if you speak in tongues, but I would rather, or the word rather is a word of preference. Of course, it would be better that you prophesied than that you spoke in tongues. Now, there was a problem in Corinth, a lot of problems in Corinth. Matter of fact, this entire letter that's written to the church at Corinth, this entire letter is about problems in the church. And you have to remember that. Many individuals will uh, try to teach how to do things wrong and misinterpret the Scripture, and they think that you know, the Scripture is trying to teach babbling, that sort of thing, incoherent babbling, but it actually isn't. It's talking about that very thing. In other words, they were doing what they do today in the first century. There were people that were showing off how spiritual they were by speaking in tongues and didn't help anyone. No, being practical, practically speaking, 1 Corinthians 14 is implying that people did speak in tongues and that they desired to speak in tongues. It's not saying it doesn't happen. It was saying it did happen. If God's Spirit came upon you in the fullness of power and you spoke in a language you did not know, could that be helpful for you to have that experience? Sure could. Yeah, could. It would help you to know that God is speaking through you. Wouldn't it? Have you ever needed confirmation by God? You ever just felt like, you know what, I want God, I want to be val I want God to validate me. Not to others, but to me. You know, I want I want to know God speaking to me. I want to know God is speaking through me. I want to know that I know God. Assurance is a struggle. Assurance is a struggle for most believers, actually. Matter of fact, I don't think I've ever met a believer that didn't struggle in the area of assurance until they understood what God's Word says about it. Do you think that speaking in an unknown language may be a validation that would help you with your assurance? Or is if God's Spirit is speaking through me, then God's Spirit is in me. Right? So there's a validation here. And uh, Paul is saying, hey, you could be validated. I'd rather that you did something that wasn't just good for you, but that it was good for the church. Okay, so implied here, Paul is saying, really the place for speaking in an unknown language is not church, if it's for you. Matter of fact, if you're a lady, it's never in church. We'll see that if we get to it in our text this, tonight. Matter of fact, let's just do that. Uh, let's, let's leave off a lot of what we're looking at here, and let's just look at the, the rules for speaking in tongues. Uh, verse 6, Paul gives 
Paul gives, we ought, listen, we ought to read the second part of verse 5. He that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. Or great is he, greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Okay? Now, verse 6, Paul is giving an argument. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? Okay, so Paul's argument here is hypothetical. Is what good is it for you if I speak in tongues, if I don't prophesy or give you supernatural knowledge, God said this, or uh, this is going to happen, or doctrine, which is just teaching about God. Okay, even things without life, verse 7, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? I wish Bella were here tonight. She's not here, but you all know Bella, right? The little blonde girl. And Bella wants to do special music in church. Now, she could do special music in church if she came and practiced with the other kids, but she wants to do her own special music in church. And so uh, she is trying to replace Brother Scott Dewey, who moved away in Miami Beach. Scott Dewey's very, very talented on the trombone. And, uh, you know, he'd show up and just play and always do specials and so forth. Well, Bella's like, you know, she'd love going to Miami Beach and hearing Scott play his horn, his trumpet, she called it, his trombone. Uh, and anyway, so Bella decided to replace him. Some of y'all saw a couple weeks ago she had a little guitar, a kid's guitar here, which she would not let me tune for her. Uh, but she had a little guitar. And on the way down to my, well, she had a flutophone first, didn't she, a couple weeks ago, before that. So she had a flutophone on the bus on the way down. She's playing songs, and she played Name That Tune with us. And so she would just like blow notes with like <laughs> Then she'd say, what's the tune? And <laughs> Mrs. Price, she was playing with Mrs. Price would just guess and guess. She'd be like, you don't know? And then she'd tell us what hymn or song it was that she was playing. She was playing an uncertain sound. Then she had her untuned guitar, which she doesn't know how to play, but she's strumming without even the right rhythm. No rhythm, just like... Now, what did I play? And, you know, you need to be a prophet to find out. Well, she, she, she was playing Dare to be a Daniel. You know, standing by a purpose firm, heeding God's command. You know, that song, she was like... What did I play? And uh, Mrs. Price, she said, you know, I used to be really good at, at playing Name That Tune when I was a kid. I could always get it. But uh, she's evidently fallen a long ways because she couldn't guess any of Bella's <laughs> songs. Why? Well, because the music made an uncertain sound. In other words, it was just random. It was just noise. Right? Um, now, you folks that are musicians, you would know the difference between something that's harmonious and something discordant, right? All right, so that's a chord. That's that's discord. That doesn't quite go together, does it? The way it ought to. You understand uh, what I'm trying to say? In other words, you just make it noise, right? I mean, there's noise. There's notes. Now you could sing that. That would be real hard to sing, wouldn't it? It's noise. Okay. If a person is speaking in an unknown tongue and nobody knows what the tongue is, it's noise. That's what the apostles saying here. Saying you just if you're just blah 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 blah, you know. Uh, if Tony were here, Tony used to practice speaking in tongues for us, so I could ask him when I needed him to. He could do it for you, but he says things like Osama bin Laden by Hande, or uh, you know Sandala Handala Gastala. It's his sound, and he, he likes to do the Allah sounds. But uh, anyway, noise is just noise. If it doesn't have a meaning, it's just noise, right? <coughs> Ask a person who speaks in tongues sometimes, what do you mean? All right, let's, let's move on. In verse 8, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? There's reveille, there's lunch call, there's all the different calls on the trumpet. Mm -hmm. But if it's just like... I want to tell some stories here, but I can't. I got some funny stories about trumpets, but this is not the place for it. Uh, so likewise ye, except ye utter by 
the tongue, words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kind of voices, kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. He's talking about languages. There's a lot of different languages, and none of them are without meaning. They they mean something. You know, I can even tell. I can speak cat a little bit, right? Can you speak cat? Meow. Meow. What's the cat mean when he's saying that? Meow. Meow. Oh! Wow! Oh! Wow! Well, if it's frigid and you're in Kansas, the cat's saying, let me in. It's miserable out here. Uh, it means, look out, I'm about to whack you. I'm about to scratch you. you know? I'm about to slap a dog or something like that. Get back. Stand back. I can speak cat pretty well. You know, you got all the different sounds where the cat's telling you what he thinks. What he's saying, right? I can speak cat, I can speak, depend, different dogs have different languages. Uh, so different breeds of dogs talk different ways, but I can speak dog pretty well. I can speak my brother's dog. Uh, I know what he's saying when he talks. If my brother's dog ever barks, he saw a raccoon. And he's saying, let me go kill the raccoon. That's what he means when he, when he starts barking. He'll start barking frantically, and it's because he saw a raccoon. He doesn't bark for anything else. He only barks for So I know if he's barking, he's saying, there's a raccoon, I need to kill it. And he will, if you let it. And uh, that's what he means. That's what he's, when he speaks dog. Uh, even critters have meaning in what they say, right? There's a lot of voices, and he's talking about and voices in the world. None of them was about signification. I can, I can tell it's raining out by listening to the birds. You ever notice birds get really, really happy when it's like starting to rain? They just are out there and nothing much has happened. It's just starting to rain, but they are just yipping it up. I mean, they're talking smack to everybody. You know, they're, they're talking birdies big time. Voices aren't without signification. In verse 11, then we see a conclusion. Therefore, I, I, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Now, do barbarians have languages? Yeah. Do they have languages? Yeah. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. But you know what? Paul is evidently saying, the one language I don't speak is the barbarian language. And uh, he sounds like a barbarian to the barbarian. In other words, it's, it's un uncoherent. Uh even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, see that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Now, friend, here's the first rule for spiritual gifts. Help the church with it. Say something, do something. If you're going to do it, have it be for the sake of building up the body. You say, Pastor, it makes me feel good just to watch somebody. Well, it makes me laugh to watch some people, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, laughter is a medicine, but I don't think that's what the Scripture signifies. I'm be a little sarcastic about that. You understand what I'm saying? If a person stands up babbling, it's nonsense. I remember, I've just never been comfortable in this environment, and again, I'm sharing personal experience probably a little too much, but I remember the first time I went to a church, I think with my grandmother, the first time I ever went to a charismatic church, and this lady just annoyed me to death. She started this first, you know. She started this, and then she started going, Thank you, Jesus, 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 thank you, Jesus. After about 15 minutes, I wanted to say, Shut up. They're trying to talk up there, and you're back here going, Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. You're just a distraction. You're not helping anybody. Shut up. That's what I wanted to say to her. I was only a kid, and I. I might tell someone to shut up today no, uh, sure. because I'm a pastor and you're allowed to. <laughs> right? If you're a pastor. Right? But that's what I wanted to say uh, to, to the lady. Uh, and then she started on doing a bunch of other stuff. And she's right in front of me. I'm a kid. She's taller than me. And she's in front of me doing this. And I'm trying to watch the guy, you know? And, watch the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets... It gets kind of ridiculous. Now, I'm not trying to be a Christian comedian tonight, but honestly, that's just nonsense. That does not edify. That attracts attention to that person. I don't know that lady's name, but I remember her today. I do not remember what happened on the platform. I remember what was taught that day. 
All I remember is that lady getting in the way. That's all I remember. Why did she do that? Well, as the judge of all hearts of men, I can tell you. She wanted, she was showing off. She wanted people to know she was spiritual. And so she carried on. You know, why did she want people to know she was spiritual? Well, I found this out later in life, watching the people that do that. Probably because during the week she wasn't at all spiritual. I just found out, for the most part, those individuals that go into the church house and attract attention to themselves for the sake of convincing other people that they're spiritual are doing so to cover up for themselves the reality that during the week they live godlessly. And I mean godlessly. I mean living in sin. Living godlessly and showing up in the church house and having a spiritual experience for your own edification to convince yourself that you're not godless. Frankly, with few exceptions, therein is the motive. Okay, let's finish. I keep saying that. 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. No, we'll go, we'll go more quickly. <laughs> Verse 13, here's the rules. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Okay. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at thy giving of thanks? Now, Amen, so be it, I agree. So what Paul is simply saying here is that if you're going to speak with an unknown tongue, know what you're saying. I had a Hebrew professor some years back. I think he's with the Lord now. He did this one time. It's not very nice. And, you know, it's unfortunate that I know so many people who aren't nice. But this is something he did. On vacation, he went into a church, and they were speaking in tongues in the service. And he got up and spoke in Hebrew. Uh, he gave the gospel in Hebrew. And he knew Israeli Hebrew. He was fluent. So he gave the gospel in Hebrew. And another man stood up and interpreted for him. <laughs> And prophesied. <laughs> he said, da 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 just made up a bunch of nonsense. Then he stood up and he said, I was speaking Hebrew, and that isn't what I said. I said, and he gave the gospel, and then he left. Now that's not nice to expose those frauds <laughs> for frauds, but that's what they were. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go around to churches. Uh, if they are such, and uh, you know, messing with people. The reason being is that I'm busy. I go to church on Sunday, so I don't have time for that. <laughs> so that's something you'd do if you didn't have a life and that if you were a little bit mean and cruel. Okay, so now Paul is going to give uh, some rules for speaking in tongues. Uh, first of all, he said you need to do it this way. Look at verse 26. There's a lot in between, but in verse 26 he gets to the crux or the conclusion. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. Now what would be the purpose of speaking in a language that you do not know in the church? Well, again, it's been said over and over and over again, isn't it? Edifying. How is it edified? Well, it's either prophecy, God said, supernatural word of knowledge, or it is uh, a revelation. This is, this is something that's been revealed. Uh, it would be similar to the, what God used the Apostle John to do in the Revelation. You know, you can understand a lot of things in the Old Testament by reading the Revelation, can't you? Revelation. Uh, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done, or a doctrine, I'm sorry, doctrine is teaching. Here's some things that God showed me I need to teach you. Okay, here's another, here's an if. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So here's the rules for speaking in an unknown tongue in church. Two or three. What happens when everybody is just blah, 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 blah. And I, blah, 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 it's not nice words, but what happens when everybody's doing that? It's, it's just a mess, right? And that's what happens. Okay, so the rule is two or three and take turns. 
in order. In other words, it would be like this if it were done the scriptural way. Before the service begins, you would probably approach the pastor or the apostles, depends on who's leading in these services, but you would approach and you would say, uh, Paul, Brother Paul, God's going, God is using me tonight, has a message in, in an unknown language that, that uh, I'd like to share with the church. And he'd say, okay, let's sign you up. And uh, what language are you going to speak? <laughs> Seriously, what language? What language will that be this evening? Well, it'll be whatever. Okay, well, we have a brother in the church, and he does speak that language, and so that'll work. We'll have him, you speak it, and he'll interpret it. Now listen, I don't speak, you know, very much Spanish. Spanish. <laughs> me no me no speaking much Spanish. <laughs> I don't speak very much Span Spanish. So if this evening, if I were to speak Spanish, <laughs> I know Charlie does, right? Because Charlie speaks all the languages, Spanish and, and garlic and everything, whatever they are. <laughs> so everything. So this is what happens when you clown too much. You you, you change words in your head, and pretty soon it like becomes the permanent reality. I noticed the other day that I don't use uh, proper English when I say things. I say, I can get, instead of may I have. I just picked that up from people that's, that speak that way, and I did it jokingly, but now I say it. I'm afraid I'm going to be in some place and I can get some more, you know, to somebody. That's probably not the way. May I have some more? Anthony, I, we've been working on that, haven't we? We both picked that up. So we've been working on our English, and that's what happens. Okay, now, <laughs> in first... 27. In verse 28, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay, so you have to have an interpreter. If you're going to speak, you have to sign up. It can only be two or three, and you have to have an interpreter. What, what language are you going to speak? Well, I'm going to speak Spanish, and Brother Charlie is going to uh, interpret for me. That'd be good, wouldn't it? If I had a word of knowledge in Spanish this evening, and I mean, I spoke fluent Spanish, and Charlie said, well, here's what he said. That would add a, an additional dose of validity to what I say, especially for Charlie. Because if he's interpreting, you have to take his word for it that I'm actually saying something, and he's not just making it up as well. But if I'm speaking Spanish, and he knows Spanish, then folks, he knows something supernatural is happening. And that at least will help him, won't it? And if the message is good, it will help everyone. If it's doctrine or revelation or prophecy, it will help everyone. Let me ask you a question. Is there doctrine in the Bible? Yeah. Is there revelation in the Bible? Yeah. Is there prophecy in the Bible? Yes. So it would be biblical. Wouldn't it? That brings us to our conclusion. We'll get there in a minute. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. This is the problem with the people who have prophesied to me. I've judged it. You say, Pastor, you're judgmental. No, I mean using judgment. As I've taken what the Word of God says and what they said, and I've compared the two, and... I'm sorry, I haven't bumped into a legit prophet. I'm not saying there aren't legit prophets. I'm not saying God couldn't tell someone something, but I haven't met one. I've met a lot of false prophets. And I've taken the Word of God and said, based on what you said, here's what the Bible says, and they have told me that their authority is greater than the authority of the Scripture. Same as the Roman Catholics do. My friend, I wholeheartedly reject that on the authority of the Scripture. Does that make sense? Okay? So, first of all, you have to have two or three. You have to do it in order. And you have to have an interpreter speak in tongues. If you're going to speak prophecy, you have to have two or three. And you have to have a judge. You have to have a judge. It has to be concurring. This is true. If anything be revealed by, to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. 
Okay, so if God gives this guy a message and it's true, he doesn't need to say anything. It's been said. Oh, yeah, 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 brother, let me add. No. <laughs> Let's just hear the message, plain, simple. And we don't need validation. Uh, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Okay? So if prophets can't agree that you're a prophet, you're not a prophet. This is sort of like an ordination, isn't it? The Bible says, lay, no, lay hands on no man suddenly. You know, that's kind of important. I've seen individuals not take that verse of the Scripture very clearly. It's very important that we as believers, when we ordain individuals to the gospel ministry, that we see the validation and the Spirit of God validates for us. I have declined several ordination ceremonies, declined attending, because I know that that individual ought to be ordained. Not because I'm a judge of men, because I know things I know. And friend, that's important, isn't it? It's vital for us. Okay, here's the last one that we're going to get to. Um, God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. Verse 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, this is not saying women can't have conversations when they come into the church house. Does that make sense? The church is the assembly, and when the assembly gathers together, then the women aren't to be the prophets or speaking in tongues. That's a problem in every charismatic church I've ever seen. It's usually the women speaking, leading the service, and it's normally the women doing the babbling and the carrying on, almost always. And uh, the Bible says if you're going to speak in tongues in the church, you can't be a woman. I think God just put that there so we'd know for sure that He isn't doing it. I'm not even being sarcastic with that. It just shows that God knows a lot more than man knows. Um, I don't know how many people have a problem with this verse and with its compliments in the pastoral epistles. My friend, God said it. I don't make an apology for it. I'm not sorry for it. Uh, women are equal to men. There's no uh, superiority. But there is an authority that God has made. And in spiritual matters, a husband is to be the leader and he's to be the authority. And if his wife is leading the entire church, it's not likely he can lead her at home. And uh, God knows what He's talking about. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. <laughs> Paul said a prophet needs to be validated by the prophets. And if you think you're a prophet, why don't you acknowledge that what I've said is true? Read that to a prophet someday. Say, so I want you to agree on this, and this, and this, and this. I want you to agree two or three only, in order. Known language, an interpreter. I want you to agree two or three prophets. Judges of the prophets, in order. I want you to agree that the women aren't going to do it. Can women, can women, uh, could women prophesy? Could there be women prophets? Yes. Yes. There could. Could they receive supernatural? I mean, is God silent to women? No. Not at all. And so if God spoke or said anything to them, they could acknowledge that this is true. We read in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 11, and not for uh, an insignificant reason. The reason we read 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, is because the Bible says whether there be prophecies, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And he, that's, I guess, uh, verse 10. Uh, and then he says, we, we know in part, I better read it because I'm, I'm misquoting. If 
thought I had First Corinthians in my Bible, but I guess maybe I didn't like it until it happened, like some folks do. Charity never fails, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be knowledge, tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. I have had people try to take this portion of Scripture and interpret it as, you know, when Jesus comes, this some future unknown event. Tell me the three purposes of prophecy. Edification is the purpose, but what are the three ways of it, the three means of edification? Do doctrine. Doctrine. Yeah, prophecy. Re Revelation. Okay. Does this do that? Sure. Doctrine. Mm -hmm. Prophecy. Yeah. Revelation. Yes. I don't think it's coincidental that John finishes the revelation. And if any man shall take away the words from the words of the, of the book of this prophecy... God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And from the things which are written in this book, I skip verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book, and if any man shall take away. I'd say it's pretty much all there. Wouldn't you? For that reason... I live confidently knowing that I don't need you to be a prophet for me. I don't, that sounds sarcastic, that sounds cynical, sounds mean. But my friend, I've got everything I need. You say, Pastor, I'm a prophet, I have a word of knowledge. I'm open, sort of. With a big capital S, sort of. In other words, my experience is that's a bunch of nonsense. You thought I was going to say baloney, but baloney would not be nice. Okay? A bunch of nonsense. It's all here. It's all written. There's more in this book. Isn't there? There's more in this book than I can know. Isn't there? You know everything you can know from this book? I'm telling you... There are classics, books that I have read, classic of literature, and you could probably give me a test, and I could very nearly probably ace the test. Tom Sawyer, test me. I've read it so many times. Huckleberry Finn, I like Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens. People say Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, I think it's a little bit of a conspiracy theory. But what, be what it may. Bogest. Test me. I probably could pass the test with a hundred percent. I passed my Bible comprehensive exam in college with probably nearly a hundred percent, but it was only like a hundred questions, and it um, was a pretty basic test just to prove that you're not entirely incompetent. I learn something from this book every day. It's better than any prophet could claim to be. And my friend, it's more complete. And anyone who wishes to add to it or say that it isn't enough, I'm sorry. I don't really have much time for that. The way that tongues is performed today. It's not the Bible way, is it? Could it be done the Bible? Could it be done the scriptural way? In other words, is God limited? That's the question. Is God limited somehow? No. I've just never seen it done the Bible way. Could there be prophecy the Bible way? First of all, tell me what for. First tell me what for. Somebody comes to me and says, 
Pastor, I have a word of knowledge for you. I say, what for? What for? Give me a reason for a word of knowledge. I want to spout off some kind of nonsense that is designed to impress me that you're spiritual. I don't need it. As a matter of fact, I'm very impatient with it because it's blasphemous. <laughs> Speak in tongues. Pick your interpreter. Do it in order. And if God gives you doctrine, revelation, and prophecy, it'll probably be something that's already in this book. Because this is a perfect book. So we kind of come full circle. You ask the question, Pastor, do you believe in the fullness of power? Yes, I do. The Bible way. Do you believe it's possible for God to do anything? Yes, I do. Do you think God will ever use... <coughs> Tongues, prophecy, revelation at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? No, I don't. Because I don't have a reason to think any otherwise. I know what the Word of God says. I know what the Word of God is good for. And I'll be quite frank with you. I seriously doubt you came here to hear me tell you what God told me that you can't find in this book. <coughs> Did you? You go somewhere else and get that. <laughs> Father, thank you for what you've taught us this evening. Lord, it's simple, uh, somewhat, somewhat discombobulated a little bit tonight. But yet, Father, I think that the message of your word is very clear. And God, it's not given to be critical or unkind, but to help us to have confidence about what we believe, and how we practice what we believe. Help us to be fully assured, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.